This video is going to show you the high fidelity simulator that we have uh, here at Mercy Regional EMS Training Center. And we're going to discuss as well the simulation process that you'll be going through. Um, first of all, um, a couple things. Our goals today is to find out all the functions of this simulator. Um, and then we're also going to describe how to handle him properly during the simulation process. We're going to go through and show all the functions of the simulator, um, where various uh, pulse points are, etc. And then we're going to describe the high fidelity simulation process. Before we get started, there's some ground rules uh, with the simulator. Uh, first and foremost, we're going to treat him like a real patient. Um, he is pretty durable. He's not a rugged Ron, if you're familiar with the fire service rugged Ron. Um, he's durable, but he also has some fragile points. So mainly um, his elbows are the easiest part they're going to break on him. So as we go through the simulation process, if you're going to be moving him, uh, we're going to take utmost care of making sure that his elbows stay intact and we don't tear his arms off. Um, the other thing that's extremely fragile on him is his airway. So if you're involved in a simulation that you're going to be intubating the simulator, uh, we're going to treat this like it's a real person. Uh, we're going to have fragile technique. We're going to be very um, careful as we go into with the laryngoscope blade as well as passing an ET tube. So, that's kind of the, the safe handling of him. A couple other points, um, we will not allow ink pens in the simulation um, room. Uh, he does have uh, the ability to really absorb the ink and it'll never come off. The same is true as if we were to have a piece of paper on his bare skin, uh, the simulator will absorb that paper and never come off. So those are two things that you can't have uh, in the simulation room. We'll have pencil and we'll have paper off to the side for you. Uh, gloves. We're going to wear gloves. It just helps with keeping the, the simulator clean um, and it also gets us in the muscle memory of making sure we have gloves on. So a couple of uh, housekeeping things. So looking at the simulator, uh, this is a CAE uh, pre-hospital Mediman. Um, from head to toe we're going to go through some functions. Uh, first of all, he does have the ability to talk. We'll be in a control room talking for him or we can make sounds for him as well. Um, that are kind of pre-recorded uh, sounds. Um, his eyes, they do blink. Uh, if the eyes are closed, it would be just like a real patient with the eyes closed, take it as what it is. Uh, his pupils are reactive. He can have secretions coming from his eyes, nose, or mouth. So he's, uh, he's got a lot of options there. You may not always see that hooked up. If you see some IV bags hanging off to the side of the room, uh, will tell you to kind of ignore them and they may be running those secretions. His airway is fully functional. Uh, we can do a lot of things to make difficult airways. Um, it's actually a pretty straightforward airway um, when it's set up to the basic airway, but he can be a difficult airway. He can be criped. Um, we may have a situation that you're not able to get the, the ET tube in place and we may have you crike him. Um, lung sounds. He does have speakers underneath his skin. For uh, lung sounds, they're also on the back if we were to have the simulator on the side or if you wanted to sit him up. The simulator can't be set up bolt upright uh, like you would find with a patient with difficulty breathing. So when you come into the, the simulation lab, we may tell you, hey, the patient is technically sitting bolt upright, just so you know. But you're going to probably find him at a 45 degree angle at the most. Um, some functions are lost if we were to sit him completely up. He can uh, get a needle decompression. You'll see both sides of those. Um, and he can have chest tubes inserted in as well. If we do any of uh, those procedures, we'll have special kits with the right size equipment to, uh, to use for those procedures. Um, you can listen to the heart sounds, probably a little, for pre-hospital, probably a little bit above where we're at, but for nursing, you may be listening to heart sounds. Uh, we can put four lead ECG on him. You'll see underneath the skin, there's four small posts, and um, you can hook your four lead up to them. And then he can also be paced and defib off of the large two posts that are sticking out. They're pretty prevalent there. You'll see those. Um, and we have cables that will adapt to just about any monitor that we're going to be using in training. So um, he can get chest compressions at two inches. So when we go through simulation, we want you to push for those um, two plus inches. Um, he's not allowed to have a Lucas on him. That's the one drawback there. So, um, if you're going to do a 12 lead on him, we're going to have you place the stickers on him and go through the process of acquiring the 12 lead with whatever machine you're using, but he won't give you a printout. We will, as instructors, give you that printout. Um, 
blood pressure. Um, he can have a blood pressure taken. His blood pressure correlates um, to what we have on the simulator. Um, it's very, very accurate. Um, and we'll demonstrate that in just a minute here, um, where to listen to it. The blood pressure cuff may be on either side of the patient. When it is set up at the start of the simulation, it has to stay there. So you'll never need a blood pressure cuff, you'll just need a stethoscope to, to get a blood pressure. So Rob will show you blood pressure function in the speaker location. As you can see, it's right at the, right at the AC spot. We do calibrate this periodically, so it should be um, very accurate to what the, the simulation is programmed. Perfect, just we had it set at. Um, also, when Rob was taking the blood pressure, did you hear anything? I heard the pulses. Okay, did you hear the compressor kick in? Yes. Okay, so he has a compressor um, that's built in, and you're going to hear that compressor periodically, um, and that compressor runs his breathing function. So if you hear the compressor kick in when you're listening to lung sounds, or you hear the compressor when you're um, obtaining your blood pressure, just hold that uh, portion of the blood pressure, wait for a second, the compressor will kick off and you'll be able to finish whatever it is you're doing there. Uh, bowel sounds are obtainable. Um, the, they are pretty prominent when we set them to be that way. Um, he can also be a cath, a urinary cath. Um, he is a he today. The next time that you come through a simulation, uh, he may be a she, he has the ability to be both. So the one uh, thing that cannot be done with this patient is an I.O. Um, so when you're going through your, your simulation, if you're unable to get the IV, we can discuss what would happen, um, but you can't do an I.O. Uh, I.M. spot, there is a pad there. You can give the patient I.M. injections with a 20 or 22 gauge needle. So um, that works pretty well. This uh, simulator can also uh, show convulsions. They're pretty subtle, but if you look, you'll be able to see them if you're not touching the simulator. Um, he can also uh, be programmed to bleed from some moulage points that we have purchased. Uh, so depending on what your simulation is, you may find some open wounds that are bleeding as well, uh, both venous and arterial. So that, uh, that's the main functions of them. One of the things when you uh, finish watching this video prior to coming into the sim lab and actually starting a simulation, you'll have some time to, to get those functions um, down. You'll be able to go through and feel all the pulse points. For him, probably our, our biggest limitation is his carotid pulse is difficult to feel. What we like to tell people is you'll see there's two skins, actually there's three skins that meet up here. If you kind of go where all three of those meet and push inward towards uh, the trachea, you have a pretty good time um, pretty good luck finding a pulse uh, for the carotid. Um, there's brachials, there's radials. Uh, he has femoral pulses, and the femoral pulses are a little high, but you should be able to feel them um, pretty easily. Popliteal, um, he does have pedal pulses, he has posterior tibial pulses as well. So uh, prior to going through your simulation, I recommend that you feel all those pulses. If you have problems with the carotid pulse, locating that, um, make sure you know where the femoral is. Um, it, it's pretty prominent. You'll be able to feel that. As far as equipment, he takes a 7.0 ET tube, nothing larger than that. Um, and you may find that you have to insert a little extra air in that to get a good seal. If you do have them intubated and you know you're in the right spot, we can tell that on the simulator. And um, if you're getting some blow by, we may tell you, hey, you need to put some more air in. So just be aware of that. He does take an MP airway and an OP airway. Um, they're a little bit smaller. We have a pre-designated airway kit that have strictly those sizes that he takes uh, stocked in it. IVs, uh, a 20 gauge angio at the most. Um, you can see from the IV spots, um, all it really is is a tube with two elbows on it, and you just obviously have to shoot for in between those two. Um, once you're in, Provided we have the right food coloring setup, you will see flash. 
So if you don't see flash, you're not in. Um, we can only use distilled water, so we'll give you a pre-spiked um, IV bag full of distilled water, and that'll be your IV, and you can push meds through that as well. If you're doing a pre-hospital scenario with us, all of our meds have been uh, drained in our drug box, and they're filled with distilled water, so every med that's in there, you'll see for training, and you can actually give that. He will not take a combi tube. Uh, we do have two combi tubes in the airway kit. One is one for you to test, to go through the motion of testing. The other one is a shortened combi tube, more used as a prop that if you didn't get the airway, you could put a combi tube in, but none of the balloons will blow up. So I think that covers all the functions, unless Rob has something to add. Negative. Okay. Um, it's talking about the high fidelity process. This is something that's new that um, locally we haven't used a lot of until uh, recently. So you have to, first of all, kind of know what the whole process is going to be. When you come into the simulation lab, before you actually step into the lab, we're going to have you sign a log um, that has the date and the time. Uh, we'll print your name and sign it. And what you're doing by signing that is you're agreeing to um, the, the simulation log agreement. And basically what that covers is confidentiality. So you treat this simulation as kind of a HIPAA thing for training. We don't want you to walk out of the simulation room and tell your, your partners what you had. We only have so many scenarios. So we need you to keep what happened in the sim lab in the sim lab so everyone gets the same learning experience you did. So when you sign that log, you're agreeing to that confidentiality agreement. You're agreeing to treat the simulator, um, as we discussed, making sure that we're careful with the elbows um, and that we're treating them very, very gently and that you let us know if something broke so we know that. The last thing that you're agreeing to in that um, agreement is the fact that we can video you and that we can take pictures. Um, the video portion of it we'll, we'll talk about briefly here. If you're in our lab or you're in our mobile sim lab ambulance, you will be videoed for debriefing purposes only, but there may come a time that we have um, some kind of news uh, media here that may want pictures or video, and by signing that agreement, you're allowing that to happen. So that's the, that's the agreement you sign when you come in. The learning environment for simulation, it's more of, it's not a skill-based situation and a teaching situation. It's really more centered on you as the student. So we're going to need you to buy in on the process. We realize this isn't a, a real person. Um, we realize there's limitations. You're not going to be able to tell what color his skin is or the condition. Um, so there's some limitations with it. But we need you to buy in on the process and try to treat this as a real patient as much as you can. Uh, when he talks, the, the voice will come out of his mouth. We need you to address the simulator just like you would a real patient. So it requires that buy-in that although he's not real, he's as real as we're going to get. And accept the fact that there are shortcomings. Uh, we try to make it as realistic as possible, but there's some things that we just can't make 100%. If you're doing an EMS simulation, it'll start out with a dispatch, and then you'll respond, you'll call on location, you'll treat your patient, and your simulation will end when you call the hospital with a rate of report. So that's the whole process. A couple other things that I um, probably missed as far as limitations. The pulse ox won't show up on your monitor. It'll show up on a monitor on the wall once it's put on the patient. Um, we can't get an accurate end tidal CO2, so that's something that you'll have to ask for as well. So just a couple other things that um, we may have to give you. If there's ever a question in the middle of a simulation, please just ask. Um, we'll tell you if you can obtain it from the simulator or if we have to give you that information. This simulation process, like I said, high fidelity is something a little bit different in the sense that it's real time. It's not like if you've been through an ACLS course and you gave a drug and you say, okay, that drug is in. That doesn't happen this way. It's real time. You give the drug, the body will respond appropriately. Um, if you say, well, I get another set of vitals, you're going to take another set of vitals. We're not going to give it to you. So it's all real time, and that's part of the learning process. So when the process is over, when the simulation is over, we'll let you know overhead. And what will happen is we'll shut the simulator down, we'll put away the supplies that we're using, and restock it for the next group, and then you'll be brought into a separate room where you'll be debriefed. And the debriefing is really where the learning process occurs. Um, it's based more on you, the learner, um, the participant, to talk about what went well, what didn't, what you would do different. Um, it should be a very um, student-friendly environment. Uh, you should be able to speak freely. 
uh, be courteous to others about what happened in, in the simulation. And truly, that's where we have found that most students learn. Uh, we do the, um, video of these because we find out that when they're in the simulation room, the student may not realize what they say. And they come out and they watch themselves on video and they realize that, oh, I need to change the way I address people. I need to way, change the way I say things to people because it sounds really bad. So we'll watch the video. Uh, you as the learners will come up with things that you could do better or discuss what went well and everyone learns from that situation. So, um, different process, uh, high fidelity simulator we're not used to. Uh, I think with a couple simulations, uh, as well as a good orientation prior to starting the simulation, going through and finding all those things we discussed this morning. Uh, you'll be very comfortable with this and I think you'll find it's a positive learning experience.